In 1968, Gustavo Gutierrez coined the term liberation theology in response to the condition of social justice that was occurring in Latin America during that time. Gutierrez explained that the root cause of social injustice is sin. Sin. Liberation theology proposes to release exploited people from their oppressors. The principal methodology used here is seeing theology from the perspective of poor and oppressed people. Gutierrez explains to effectively do liberation theology, you need to live among them, enter into solidarity with the poor and oppressed. Get to know that get to know them, get to know their conditions, get to know what exactly is the oppressive force, and do the theology from the bottom up. Theology is defined as faith seeking understanding. In other words, theology is an attempt to understand or explain something that you believe in. In a sense, Every one of us is a theologian. All of us at one point or another have tried to provide explanation for the seemingly inexplicable things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives. <gasps> it's a sign. Liberation theology has taken on many forms throughout the years, beginning with Latin America in the 1960s. This form of theology was later practiced by the African-American community during the United States Civil Rights Movement through what is known historically as black theology. And then shortly after, specifically African-American women created their own form of theology called womanist theology that explored the issues pertaining specifically to African-American women. In a similar fashion, a more recent form of theology has emerged over at least this past decade known known as queer theology, focusing on the oppression and the issues that the LGBTQ community faces daily. All forms of liberation theology look to scripture for wisdom and understanding. Gutierrez popularized the phrase, preferential option for the poor, indicating that scripturally, God appears to have a preference towards those who are labeled insignificant, marginalized, unimportant, needy, despised, and defenseless. For example, in the scriptures, God favored Abel and Jacob, who were second-borns to Cain and Esau, respectively, in a culture that valued the firstborns. God worked miracles through the barren women of Sarah and Rachel and New Testament Elizabeth. You need to understand that during biblical times, barrenness was considered a grave sin. A woman who can't produce is shunned by society. Barrenness was an indicator that you did something wrong, that, that God is punishing you for something. In other words, barren women were labeled by the community, that is the religious community, as sinners. Moses, who had a stutter, was asked to be God's spokesperson and then liberated his people in the greatest Old Testament liberation story, the Exodus. David, the youngest born in a house and a shepherd boy, was chosen to be the greatest king of the Jews next to Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus was raised in a backwater town called Nazareth, a town that people down south in Jerusalem never would have respected, let alone expect the king of kings to come from. Can anything good come from Nazareth? From his humble origin, Jesus goes on to defeat sin and death. Again, prime liberation stories to anyone feeling hopeless and lost. The Matthew and Luke Jesus provides us with beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty. And blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus chose the Samaritan woman at the well in John's gospel to be the first person that he essentially outs himself to as being God. Not only were women second-class citizens, but Samaritans were labeled by the mainstream society, in other words, the church, as being grave sinners. These people were despised by the Jewish church, being deemed as unclean and having impure blood. You can see this abundantly made clear when the woman tells Jesus that they can't drink from the same water source. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Sound familiar, huh? You can see why this form of scripture was popular among liberation movements. In addition to God's preference towards the poor and vulnerable, liberation theologians point to the call to social action by the apostles, Jesus, and the Old Testament prophets. During his ministry, Jesus did not hesitate to call out the institutional Jewish church known as the temple for its unfair treatment of its members. People who were deaf, dumb, blind, maimed, barren, poor, were all labeled and considered grave sinners according to the Jewish purity system. 
laws that were derived from the Torah, predominantly in the book of Leviticus. In fact, one of the primary reasons why God became incarnate, God took on the form of Jesus, was to fight his church against the unfair misinterpretation of God's laws. Jesus himself was not about maintaining social stability, but instead pushing social unrest. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, Jesus explained in Matthew's gospel, a gospel known for the author's bias against the institutional church. So although we barely scratched the surface right now, I hope you can see that scripture does provide some material for liberation theologians to work with. And I hope you could also see that the LGBTQ community could use these exact same passages and even others to help promote their liberation from oppression. So you may not like what I'm doing, but wait. Do you hear that? There's something going on outside. Let me see. Stand up for yourselves! At least that's what I'm trying to do with this series. Oh, hey. Sorry, not really my type. 